last night was supposed to be Ted Cruz's night. Uh, we beat him in half the states on the ballot. We won the state of Minnesota. We picked up a lot of delegates, and we feel great about what the map looks like now moving forward, and especially here when we get to our home state of Florida. So Sir, we're excited. Senator, we're one, one question. Why is Senator, Florida so important? Why is Florida so important? It's a big state, and it's my home, and we're going to win Florida. We feel great about it. At what seemed to be the very last minute, Florida Senator Marco Rubio was thrown a campaign bone that may not have a lot of meat on it, but it did give him that chance he needed to be at least Eh, maybe try to gnaw away at the seemingly insurmountable lead Donald Trump has for the Republican presidential nomination. Fair to say, in that sense, Senator Rubio may not have to personally thank each and every person who voted for him in Minnesota, because without their lifeline, his campaign would be completely sunk, no chance of refloating, at least that is conventional wisdom. Let's break with convention. Understand wisdom from the North Star State, the Gopher State, or more to my personal liking, the state of hockey. Our guest is director at the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Professor Lawrence Jacobs. All right, Professor, Minnesota throws out the lifeline and they save Marco Rubio. What do people in the state of Minnesota know that we don't? They saw Rubio. The other candidates didn't show up. No sign of Trump. Uh, and there was a lot of energy for Rubio. He had former Governor Tim Plenty out and a number of the other uh, kind of big dogs in the Republican establishment working for him. Does the research, though, tell us that there was any other candidate that the people of Minnesota may have been willing to go for had they been maybe a little more coerced or a little more coddled, if you will? Sure. There was certainly uh, support for uh, Cruz and for Trump. They just didn't put much resources in it. If uh, Cruz and Trump had campaigned here, I think they would have had a strong chance of winning. If you go back just to last cycle, uh, you know, we saw some pretty conservative candidates uh, do quite well here. So basically, then, if we're going to go ahead and use a sports metaphor, this was a mulligan. It was either a mulligan or just like uh, mailing it in, you know, just uh, a no show. They kind of just abdicated the state of Minnesota because they were putting their time and energy in states with more delegates, that, uh, you know, up for grabs. We just a couple of minutes ago talked a little bit about this with D.C. McAllister from Washington, and we were discussing the fact of personalities here and a lot about conservatism and republicanism and where it's going at this point. But she kept making, which I think is a very good point, people need to take emotion out of this and they need to take personalities out of this in order to then make a decision, a real logical decision is her point, on who to have as your next president. But honestly, Professor, is that possible in this day and age? We, we put emotion in everything that we do. We're, we're, we're drawn to it. Yeah, I think it's emotion, but it's also what issues. And, uh, you know, the issues that Donald Trump is talking about, uh, which is a deep economic angst, a fear, um, you know, those are emotions, but it also speaks to reality of a whole lot of middle America feeling economically uh, insecure and worried about their future. So are we then looking at a, a, a real sea change here in how we pick candidates in a lot? Well, let's go to caucuses and let's talk about caucuses. And, and as a matter of fact, you retweeted something recently on caucuses itself, which talked a little bit about whether or not they really get the job done. The idea of caucuses are democratic, but its practice is undemocratic. As I argued here, that was a retweet from Julia Silvis, I believe. What is it? Is it possible that our whole system basically is just archaic at this point and needs to be changed? Absolutely. Uh, if you look at the idea behind caucuses and primaries, very noble. It was to make the people in charge. And you back it up a couple hundred years and you see that there was the struggle against first the King Caucus in Congress that was choosing the nominees. And then, you know, the dirty backroom politics of national conventions led to primaries. And all this was to empower the people. But where are we today? There's a relatively small number of people who are usually more uh, ideological and single issue oriented, who show up for uh, caucus uh, in, and for primaries uh, than the general electorate. In Minnesota, maybe 300,000 people showed up uh, last night in the caucuses, which is a record numbers uh, for Republicans, but almost 10 times that number will show up on general election day. So you got this small number of folks who are not representative of either party who are choosing the candidates that the vast majority of us have to then, uh, you know, kind of scratch our heads and, and choose them off. i only got 30 seconds left. Is there a quick fix for this? You know, I don't think it is, because what are you going to say? You're going to say, let's let's bring it back to the smoke filled rooms. No, no one's for that. I think it's really going to require some hard thinking. 
And I think the Republican Party is going to be up for it because this is a unmitigated disaster if Trump is the candidate. He's not a Republican. Democratic side, Bernie Sanders is a declared uh, Democratic Socialist. He's certainly not a Democrat, and yet he's in the hunt for the Democratic Party nomination. We are seeing an absolute change in our political system, our party system here in America. I never thought I'd see it in front of my own eyes, but here it is, and we're going to have to see how it shakes out in November. Professor Larry Jacobs, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk again. We're going to talk an awful lot about what happens at the next Republican debate. Matter of fact, we're going to post that debate for you. That comes up tomorrow night. Only four. Ben Carson's now gone. So these four will debate it out Thursday night, 11 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Pacific. That's when our coverage begins right here on Newsmax and Newsmax.com. Stay with us. The Hardline continues.